Good morning, everyone. Thanks for attending today's webinar. My name is Javier Portos, and I'm presenting today with my co-worker, uh, Jake Taylor, which is the uh, Field Service Manager for the Gold Coast. Uh, the topic for today is a field inspections and testing, the best preventive maintenance practices applicable for electric motors. IPS is Integrated Power Services is a leading provider of engineering solutions for electric motors and generators. And we are actually in North America. Our headquarters is actually in Greenville, South Carolina. And we have locations coast to coast. We offer in-shop repair services, field services, and distribution over 5,000 customers to the United States and Canada. We work in continuous process, and we serve all the different kinds of industries that use electric motors and generators. The content for today's presentation is actually about field inspections and maintenance. When I look at the main components for this electric equipment, we're gonna also see electrical and mechanical failures that we, uh, we've been experiencing on these machines and how to actually run up them. We're gonna talk about the IEEE standards that give us a guidelines for preventive maintenance for this equipment. We're also gonna talk about what are the electrical testing best practices available and also mechanical inspection best practices that we can apply for these motors, especially during turnarounds, because we have limited time to do this. And we're gonna also talk about what other components and evaluations for this equipment has to be done during these opportunities, which are the turnarounds. Also, we're gonna talk on when the motors need to be pulled out for major overhaul. We're gonna present some examples of lack of maintenance for electric motors at work. What is the primary purpose actually of inspecting the motors? Uh, actually, you know, I was trying to define, you know, when we have turnarounds, what actually we want to be focusing, what are we trying to determine? Well, the main idea here is to identify and correct or minimize any deterioration that is found on the conditions of the machine, whether this is electrical issue or a mechanical issue. So also one of the primary purposes is actually plan ahead of time, repair or replace right there at the site, but if these conditions are not corrected, then, you know, failure could occur. Now we understand during turnarounds that time available to repair during these outages is limited. And in some cases, if the spares are available, maybe you wanna choose to actually put the spare on place and take the other motor out and send it to uh, service centers to, to be actually uh, overhauled. Now, because the complexity of the machines that we have during all, for our installations, you know, they could be very, it could be different types of machines installed. It could be just as a simple as induction motor, or it could be a, a synchronous motor with a brush type or brushless type, which is more complex. Therefore, the time required to do the inspections can vary. Also, lack of trending maintenance records for electric equipment is not uncommon. In many cases, you know, we have reliability engineers where they don't have records about this machine, so they don't know how it's been tested in the past and what the conditions are for this equipment. And this is a good opportunity when you have turnarounds to actually start trending and getting information about this machine and learning about it. Production demand versus downtime equipment, now is a good opportunity because if the motor that you are inspecting it has an anomaly that can actually uh, compromise the production, now you can evaluate that you know, to assess how, how bad it is this uh, malfunction versus you, know, you are taking a risk of operating the equipment because it eventually will fail. Now, scheduling overages for inspection and work scope helps to be more efficient when the evidence of malfunctions is known or exists. For example, you have motors that already have vibration issues, or you have overheating or noise. During the turnarounds, the field service people can be concentrating and focusing in that and be able to actually determine and fix that issue. Other than just do a complete inspection of the machine, you can be concentrating on exactly what the issue is. Now, because we have many industries that probably are right now listening. So we have cement plants, pulp and paper, mining, uh, petrochem, uh, pipelines. We have chemicals, refineries. Uh, we have all these kind of industries. The motors that are used, they can vary it because they have different loads. They have mechanical loads on it. They have electrical loads. The process and the environmental conditions where these motors are exposed can be different too. So therefore, the outages could be different from industry to industry. It could be maybe every 36 months or three years, or it could be five, seven, or 10 years. It depends on the industry. Now, this is an example of 
four motors and on the left corner, we have an, a motor that is called open motor. And what I try to illustrate here is these motors are exposed to any environmental condition that is surrounding the motor will get in contact with internal components. This is a typical WP2 for this particular OEM where any, all the air surrounding the machine, including debris or any chemicals or any uh, water, including water and any uh, uh, conditions surrounding the machine will get in contact because the air will suck it in and it will inside the machine and it will exhaust from the sides. So that means that open motors can be exposed to any you know, contamination surrounding the motor. On the right picture, it's actually a synchronous motor that is uh, supported by pedestal bearings. This particular motor is a totally enclosed water heat exchanger. It's also called the TWAT. Therefore, this is a complete uh, enclosed machine where the air surrounding the motor will not get in contact with the winding. Therefore, you expect these windings internally to keep a lot cleaner than open motors. On the bottom picture on the left side, there's actually a motor on the cement plant moving a mill application. As you can see, there is a lot of ash, a lot of uh, contamination that it will get in contact with the internal components of the motor or the winding as well as the rotor. Therefore, you know, these contaminants will get built up into the entrance and eventually, you know, you need to pull those motors out to, to be able to do a good cleanup or you can do it on the site as well. So the cleanup can be done on the site. We have a slide that we're going to show later on that you can see that a lot of this cleaning can be done at the site. On the right picture, we have another configuration of machine, which is a vertical. That's a vertical pump. And it's an induction motor where this actually is installed in the Gulf Coast, where there is a lot of salt uh, environmental conditions. There is a lot of rain. Therefore, there is a lot of humidity. And that humidity with all these contaminants will get into the winding. And eventually, you know, you don't clean them up, but you don't check and make sure that you make those stators properly. Then eventually, we start deteriorating until the motor will get. So it's important during the turnarounds, make observations and look into the, uh, the windings and make sure that you don't have any contamination that would deteriorate the insulation. Now, when we have a motor, you have actually on the left picture, that is actually on the uh, uh, work pump paper application, that's a box. You don't get to see the internal components at all. So what I try to illustrate here is the motor frame, you can see that it's bolted on the sole plate. You have covers, you have actually a coping guard. You don't see any component of the motor, therefore, you don't know how internally these uh, components are, you know, whether they are dirty, whether they are clogged, whether they have broken uh, parts. So you don't get to see that because the motor is operating. So that's why during the turnarounds, it's important to actually remove the covers and see what the internal components look like, as well as doing some testing. On the right picture, that shows after the covers have been removed. Now you can see the stereo winding, which is completely exposed. You can see the rotating components and you can see the, the blowers. And this is the internal component that will actually will rotate. It's called the rotor. You also get to see the shaft and the half of the bearing is being moved out. So you get access to the coupling and everything else. So during turnarounds, it's important to actually look at those components and make sure that there is no mechanical uh, defects on it. And we're gonna talk about what can you look for it. But what I try to illustrate here is, this is what you see on the field. But what we're really looking for is actually the conditions for these components. Now, keep in mind that the rotors rotate because they will transmit torque. Therefore, there is thermal stresses, mechanical stresses, the electric stresses that will deteriorate the machine eventually. Now, we're talking about motors that it could eventually fail after years of service. Now, why is it important to actually pay attention to the turnarounds? This statistics was uh, actually done in 2015. And what we did back then, it was for every 100 units that we received in the service centers, we analyzed what was the failure mode for these machines. So what we find out is, you know, we try to, to, uh, to separate the mechanical related failures versus electrical related failures. And what we did was we analyzed based on root cause analysis for the 100 units that we received, what was related to bearings and lubrication we find out 25 of these units were actually failing because they're in a lubrication. 28 units was due to lack of maintenance and protection. 17 units, it was for motor enclosure, cooling issues. 12 units, it was based on rotor components that start falling apart. 
seven units was related to air gap issues and 11, it was unknown reasons because not enough information was provided to do the root cause analysis. So what's important here is what can the reliability engineer do based on this statistic? Well, there is some things that you cannot control, but there is some things that you can actually make a lot of improvement. We pay attention to actually burn and lubrication as well as a lack of maintenance. That represents 53%. So by just doing a good maintenance program and paying attention and keeping this motor lubricated, you can actually drop this number. For 100 units, you can drop drastically by making improvements on that. That reliability engineers, we have control of that to reduce that rate. Likewise, for the electrical motors received on the um, service centers, 23% or 23 units were related to lack of maintenance and protection. We also observed that under those failures, 27 units was related to areas where it was in the windings and lead connections. 11 units, these failures occur on the end turns and the winding and the slot. 6% of six uh, units were due to magnetic wedges falling off. 9% or nine units was related to uh, brushless synchronous machines where this electronic start failing. 24 units, we didn't know the reason because it was not information to provide, uh, to, to come up with the root cause analysis. But again, reliability engineers can have a lot of input by actually uh, inspecting these motors, doing testing and pull them out when it's necessary before actually the motor fails. How much can we have out of this as a reliability engineer? I can make improvement on the lack of maintenance. I can make improvement by cleaning the motors and try to avoid where the windings will fail. So we have about 23, we have about 50, 61%. So for the 100 units, I can reduce the rate by actually cleaning up the motors and putting a good maintenance program for that. For 100, I can actually control the 61 units by actually making improvements at the site. Now, if we combine all these motors failure, you know, electrical and mechanical, mechanical issues is still the majority of that. 46% of the motors that receive from service centers, they're actually related to any mechanical anomaly, whether it is the rotor, whether it's the bearing or lubrication. 16% is actually due to electrical, 26% due to external reasons that has nothing to do with the motor. It could be overloading conditions or, you know, uh, or maybe a lighting that, you know, struck the motor and things like that. 12% was unknown reasons. But again, 46% is almost half of the motor. So we have control actually for the mechanical by actually implementing a good maintenance program and reducing that rate. Now, there is a standard out there that you can use uh, I was looking for what are the best practices. Uh, I find out that the IEEE 62 is an actually a, a guide for diagnostic field testing of electrical power apparatus. Uh, also the IEEE 1415 is the guide for induction machinery maintenance testing and failure analysis. And of course we have the IEEE 1068, which is the standard for repair and rewind electric motors in the petroleum, chemical and process industry. Under these three standards, you can actually have a lot of standards that will be related to testing, very specific testing. For example, if we're going to talk about MEGA in the motor, we have the IEEE 43, which it will tell you in detail what to test, how to test, and what criteria to use. Likewise, you know, you're going to do a high voltage testing, we have the IEEE 286 that will provide you a tip up test and how to actually determine that you have voids or anomalies on the insulation. But on all these testings, uh, um, standards, you, you will have detail of what testing and what standard to follow for that specific test. Now, what is the main purpose for, for this maintenance and inspection? Well, like we said, you know, it's actually identify any anomalies. And typically, the end user actually use the instruction book from the OEMs because it's a good source of information. But the problem with this is many motors that they are built, they don't know what industry they're going to be ended up. Like if the motors are standard, they can be ended up in the pulp and paper, on the cement plant, mining, uh, it could be in the pipeline, it could be you know, on the pump station, and it could be many different industries. Therefore, these environmental conditions will make the motors to actually have the maintenance program to be adjusted based on your application and based on your environmental and process conditions. Now, there is many motors that are open that may require the rotor to be removed for inspection, but also, you know, 
uh, to have a, a maintenance, and sometimes they they said it could be every three to seven years to have of, to to do these major overhauls. Now, not all machines need time-based maintenance, but the service life of all machines will be increased if prudent repair and testing programs are followed. A balanced maintenance program is based on evaluation of test results and supplemented by visual inspection performed by qualified, knowledgeable electric machine personnel. There are no test programs available that can replace the need of visual inspection. We can do an electrical test, but actually by opening and looking at the condition of the winding, it will reveal many things that you can probably not detect by just testing it. The machines must be spec for evidence of wear or deterioration. Moisture and dirt buildup can observe directly by just opening the covers. Unusual noise, leaking oil seals, or high vibrations can be often be detected. Oil level gauge should be monitored all the time. So I create this uh, uh, chart showing the main components of the model. This is very basic. So I divide into the main components. The stator, which is the static part of the uh, motor, the rotor, which is the rotating component, and the assembly. What can we see on the winding? On the winding, you know, one of the things that we're gonna do during inspection is actually do the visual inspection. Look at the wedges, make sure that they are tight. Do the insulation resistance, which is a, a basic test to provide. Look at the winding resistance, check the arms, and do the inductance and resistance balance to make sure that all the three phases are completely balanced and there is no imbalance on this inductance and resistance. Uh, we also look into the winding RTDs, check, make sure that they're all functional. And in the high voltage machines like a 6 kV and up, to perform a power factor tip up test, partial discharge test, and corona UV test is also important because that will tell you the conditions of the winding. Uh, the core is also part of the stator, and sometimes because it's steel, we forget, but we actually have to do a visual inspection. You know, it's always omit during the uh, people with no experience on, on inspecting these machines. We want to look for actually make sure that the core is tight, make sure that the bolts to, to, to hold this stacking are actually in good condition, that they don't have overheating, that there is no broken in fingers, and make sure that uh, you know, it's all uh, solid and there is no missing components. As part of the cooling, you know, on the state of we have what we call radial cooling vents, and that's important because those are the ones that will make the machine to run within the uh, parameters for temperature. In this case, you know, uh, we don't want the winding to exceed a, a, a B rise temperature. Most machines, that's what they're designed for. Therefore, when you start seeing these cooling vents to be clogged because you have extreme dirt build up, then the airflow in the machine start get restricted and the temperature start going up. And we got to make sure that these cooling passages are clear of that and that there is no dirt accumulated. But the rotor, that is a, a component that we rotate. And based on the speed, you will have centrifugal forces. You will have thermal stress. You will have heating on it. Therefore, it's important to look and do a visual inspection. Check resistance. You have a synchronous motor. If a ceiling pole, look at the same thing as the state of do a, a ground wall insulation resistance and do the turn insulation. In this case, if there is a ceiling pole, perform the voltage drop test and impedance test. Also look for any cracks that may happen on the spiders and the, on the blades and the, uh, on, the, uh, on the fans, you have a real fan. So make sure that there is no broken uh, blades on, on these uh, cooling fans. As far as the, uh, the cage, you know, you have an induction motor, you will have what we call bars and rings that they are braced together. And that's important, the joints, looking, make sure that we don't have broken rotor bars or broken rotor rings. In the case of a synchronous motor, do the same thing, even though this uh, damper cage only used during start con starting condition, still, you know, it could be an anomaly and make sure that we don't have any broken uh, uh, damper cage on, on synchronous. On the assembly, we talk about, you know, what else is besides the stator and rotor? Well, it could be the, uh, you know, the, the enclosure surrounding the motor, the bearings also. Uh, we have to uh, do and do an inspection on it and check also the air gap. It's important to do the air gap because we want the air gap to be uh, concentric and we don't have we don't want to have uh, air gaps that are uneven and it has to be checked uh, 90 degrees in each end of the motor and then compare uh, because having an uneven air gap will produce external forces that eventually will have the rotor to be deflect. It can wear actually bearings and it can damage. So it's important to do these mechanical checks. And this, this table will help you to, to, 
to go on a, on a list and, and, and do those inspections during the turnaround. Now, there is a lot of testing and uh, they can be done electrically on the field, but I listed up the basic ones and uh, how often these can be done and how effective it is, is to perform this. And I can tell you most of these testing, you know, winding resistance, insulation resistance, the PI test, source test, dissipation factor, and partial discharge, it's all, you know, it's good, but most importantly, it's a trending tool. Uh, it can be done offline, it can be done on the field, and we listed out here how typically that needs to be performed. Uh, it could be one or two years. Uh, it could be two to five years, depending on that, you know, whether it's a low voltage or, or, or high voltage. And even in some cases, partial discharge, there's some machines that they have uh, devices where it can be continuously be monitored at the field and also during operation. But this table will, will tell you, you know, how effective it is and what standard, you know, you should follow to actually perform this testing. This is very simple testing that can be done on the field. We're going to talk about that in the next slides, but this at least help you to understand what is it, the electrical testing that has to be performed on the motor. Now, this chart will help as well for the uh, rotor. You know, you're going to do winding resistance and insulation resistance, as well as you have excitation on it. Whether you have a process machine, when you have a DCAC exciter on it, same, same rule will apply as far as the insulation resistance and, and the winding resistance. Now, for the mechanical, uh, we create this chart where we uh, listed up the most important ones and the ones that you know we pay attention during turnarounds. Alignment is one of them. You know, check the alignment. It's typically done at the first time you install the motor, and during outages, you know, it has to be rechecked. Bearing insulation, you know, even the motor comes with the bearing insulation, medium size and large ones. You know, it's good to have actually tested, make sure the insulation is still. Uh, you know, there and there is no broken or damaged insulation on the bearings. Typically done during major outages and 36 month maintenance. Check the coupling as well. Check the run out of the coupling. Check the torque and the bolts. Check the air gap for concentricity. Uh, bearing inspection. Actually, have the half of the bearing out and look at the the, the condition of the bearing, seals and rings, and make sure that it's still uh, within the design parameters from the OEM. So we have some slides to show you what to look for on the on the next slides, but this is a, a good guide line for you guys to follow. You know when we have turnaround, stereo components. We already look into that. Uh, what inspection is to be done? Rotor components. The mechanical people is actually gonna check, make sure there is no broken bars, welds, and things like that. Fingers and plates. Uh, make sure that all the rotating components is still uh, you know free of any defects. Oil analysis is part of the. Uh, check also, so sample oil and send off for analysis. And this analysis could reveal what partic particulars, you know, are contaminating the oil, and therefore you can take a correction uh, measurements for that. A cooling system is also good to perform a pressure uh, test, measure that you don't have uh, pipes that are broke and it will start leaking water. And this is important because you have a motor that is being cooled by water and you have leak water on it, and you will never probably see that if it's a little bit drop. Eventually, you know, uh, after the motor is operating, that drop can become, you know, a lot of water on the bottom of the frame. And if that water gets in contact with the winding, that's probably not a good combination. And eventually, the motor could fail. Looking for all the accessories is important. Make sure that all the accessories are still on working conditions, you know, whether you have bearing RTDs, vibration detectors, leak detectors, air filters, differential pressure switch, you name it. All these accessories, you know, they need to be worked properly. Uh, work as designed, and most importantly, you know, it has to be connected. If you have an accessory there that you're not connecting, you're not monitoring, then that's not going to help because you would never know if there is an anomaly with the motor. I listed up here uh, a general inspection, the different components of the motor, but I put in highlight on yellow what I think is critical for operation. For example, the filters, you know, you don't want the filters to be actually clogged. Otherwise, you know, if, if you operate the motor with the filter clock, then you minimize or you will restrict the airflow in the motor. And if you restrict the airflow in the motor, then your motor will start overheating. And eventually, you know, it will start deteriorating the insulation. It will age the insulation thermally, and you don't even notice that. The rest are so important. Foundation, the coupling, bearings, all that is important. Terminations is another one. Terminations for the uh, uh, terminal box, for example, we have uh, leads where they are bolted into the lead hooks and they are insulated. 
but it's important to make sure that the torques used to hold these locks are actually properly tight. Otherwise, if they're loose, they can actually arc. And if they are inside the conduit box, you don't get to see that. So during inspection, it's important to open it, rip off all the insulation and inspect that. Make sure that we have a good joint. Foundation, cracks on the uh, foundation, pedestals, make sure that they are doping, they didn't move. All that is part of the uh, inspection. Couplings, make sure the runouts are good. Bearings, wear out on the bearings. Those are very critical for the operation of the motor. If you overlook that during the turnaround, it can actually give you a headache later on to, when, once the motor is up and running. Now, on the visual inspection, this, this is a picture actually of a motor, WP2, that it's installed. It's a compressor, and you can see this is actually a forced lubrication system. So it's important to actually look and make sure that, you know, right here, you will have restrictions that are part of the inspection. Make sure that the gaskets goes here on the enclosure are on place. Make sure that the uh, the exhaust of the air doesn't have any restrictions. I see motors installed on the field where actually the uh, they are restricted either in the exhaust or the air inlet where they have walls that won't let the motor to actually ventilate properly. That will affect the motor performance. You know, the other thing is look for leaks, oils. Uh, make sure that uh, the uh, abnormal smells that they are inside, you know, when you start moving and taking covers out, maybe the burning oil will tell you something, maybe the burning insulation or burning cables, that will give an indication and we can actually take uh, correction uh, measurements to fix that. So it's important to actually pay attention to those little things that are part of the visual inspection. Now, once you remove the cover, this is an example of how the uh, stator looks like. This is a synchronous motor. You can see a lot of overheating in those end turns. That machine was actually uh, restricted with the airflow, and that was after 10 years of operation. Now, the air to this did not pick it up, but you can see a lot of burning. That's what I call slow cook. Slow cook on the stator because it takes years to actually build up that amount of heat and it start deteriorating the insulation. Now, when we have brand new machines, we expect those machines to last 20, 30 plus years. And uh, but it's also important during turnarounds and maintenance to actually clean them up the stators. Otherwise, the life will be short, will be cut it because we're not providing the cleaning and the preventive maintenance that is required. So the other thing that we're going to look on the stators is if we have contaminations on the entrance, on the cooling vents also right here inside, to make sure that there is no anything that will restrict the air uh, flow in the model, on the machine. Uh, deterioration. Uh, sometimes it becomes brutal. All the tights, all the blocking, make sure they're still in place. Now, on the next slide, this is the state of a close up with the bore scope, actually. But that's when you do the inspections on the field. Uh, you can go and see the conditions. These are actually Phelps that will separate the coils. This is done by the OEM to actually is part of the support system of the coils. Now, just think about when you start a motor across the line, you have six, seven times current going through these coils during the startup. So when you have this amount of current, even though if it is for only a few seconds until the motor gets up to speed, it is present. Therefore, there is a lot of thermal stress, mechanical stress, because these coils will try to move. They will try to flex because they are not supported. They are supported here by the wedge, but not here. So all this mechanical additional support that is added to it, it will stress out. And eventually, you know, you have motor that you start several times. You know, you start, you know, start the motor uh, several times per day. It will actually, these stresses will become, you know, uh, stress up these coils. And, and this particular one, you see all these felt start breaking through. So there is overheating seen on the coils, but also these blocks start uh, breaking off. Once we put it in the shop, we actually saw a lot of that uh, blocking already on the bottom of the frame. So it's important during turnarounds, you know, to actually identify anomalies like this because you let us unattended, then eventually this coil will be loose and it will actually crack. And once it crack and, it, and crack the insulation, it will actually go to ground. Now, if you're lucky and it actually fell on the end turn, it can be just rewind. But if it actually goes to ground right here on the stereo core and it make a big hole on the lamination, then you're talking about longer lead time to repair and more actually cost because now you have to replace the winding and also restack the whole the whole stable. Rotor inspection, you know, I have a picture right here on the top of a synchronous uh, 
synchronous H1 design, uh, and also on the bottom I have a rotor, induction, induction rotor. So what's important is, I can tell you after seven or 10 years, uh, synchronous motors, typically they, they, they last for a long time, but after five, seven years, you need to go and look with the borescope and make sure that all the parts and components are still there. Sometimes you see overheating on the coils, and this particular one is supposed to have a B block here on, on place to hold the stresses of these walls of these coils, and it's missing. So they're an inspection, you know, what's missing, therefore, you know, the next step up is these coils will move, and once they move, once they move, they're gonna touch the stator, and it will be a catastrophe. Likewise for the rotors, you know, we're gonna make sure that all these laminations, and we can do that with the borescope during the uh, turnarounds, uh, go and look at these laminations, especially two and four poles. We've seen several, several models where these laminations are loose. Uh, they're supposed to be supported by these fingers over here, but once they lose, uh, this can crack, and if they crack because this is rotating, it can actually go and hit the stator, and it can hit the coils, and the motor will fail. So it's important that in turnarounds identify uh, these uh, anomalies, also broken rotor bars. You know, we can do a testing on the field to make sure that, you know, you don't have broken rotor bars. And what the broken rotor bars will do is you will start losing uh, the power of the motor and you will have vibration because there will be an imbalance uh, uh, flux on the machine, on the rotor, because it's an induction, induction machine. Now, it's important to do that during the turnaround, make sure that the rotor is not moving, the cage, especially the bar, sometimes they start migrating. And if you don't pay attention to that, uh, then you know uh, eventually it could make a catastrophic failure on it. Now, there is some techniques that uh, we've been doing it to actually alleviate this anomaly for these laminations to be loose, and uh, we can discuss that uh, because if you leave those unattended, you know, it will be a catastrophic failure and it will be a lot longer lead time to repair. When you have models that are TWAC, for example, this is a TWAC where you have water going in and water coming out, it's important you have a suspicion that there is overheating to actually remove the heat exchanger. And when we can take a look is the back iron, make sure there is no overheating, and you have the entrance also exposed. Make sure that we have all the gaskets, you know, they're supposed to be right here in the enclosure, make sure that they are in place. Otherwise, you will have cold air mixing with cold air, and eventually we'll have the motor running above radio temperature. So that's important to actually pay attention to the gasketing that goes, that came from the OEM to seal all this area. Now on this particular machine, we have what we call double lane ventilator. So there's cold air going on this end of the machine and the hot air will come from the center. Therefore, we expect a gasket you know, to be right here. Um, otherwise it will have a gap when you sit this on the top and it will mix cold air with hot air. And that's not a good thing for the motor. This is an example of a, a mill application. It's a 3,500 horsepower. Uh, that motor was reported to have high vibration. They were checking the bearings and, and there was nothing wrong with the bearings, but they never opened the covers and they keep tripping the motor on high vibration. Well, after they removed the, uh, the end cover, they discovered some of these wedges were actually dislodged. You can see the wedge actually coming out. Once the wedge come out, the coil will be loose and if they try to start the motor, you know, then eventually that coil will come out of the slot and will actually go to ground. So it was detected after they removed the cover. So during turnarounds, it is important to actually uh, inspect the stator and the rotor. In this particular one also, it was discovered that uh, you have a crack on the spider. That's, you know, a, a mill application that's very typical, but you have to go and inspect it and make sure that you have more uh, uh, cracks on the wells. Otherwise the spider will start actually deforming coming out of the ring and it will actually increase the vibration. And, but most importantly, you know, if this start becoming loose and unattended, it can actually have the rotor start touching with the stator and that would be a major, major weekend. Electrical testing, we're gonna talk about that. So this is actually a test that can be performed on the field. This is actually a, a partial discharge test performed offline on the field for a large uh, 13A kV machine. Uh, but uh, let's talk about what testing can be done. Uh, it's very basic, the uh, MEGR, uh, which is the insulation resistance and the PI test. So what did the IEEE tell you? The IEEE 43 tell you that uh, for a foam coil design, uh, we, we should have at least 100 mega ohms, you know, to be safe to energize the motor. Now, 
On the Gold Coast, we have, and other industries also, that they are have a lot of humidity around it. Uh, that could actually affect the insulation resistance because it builds up humidity on the end terms. Therefore, it's important to actually perform this test. It's very, very important to make sure that we have enough insulation resistance. When I say insulation resistance, I want to just spend maybe a few seconds on explaining what that means. This is the cross section of the view of the coil, and we have copper, and then we have insulation surrounding the copper, and then we have what we call the ground wall insulation. For example, in the 4,000 volts, we have about four half laps mica, and that's what this thin yellow represents. When we're looking for insulation resistance, we want to have enough the electric strength between the copper to ground because this coil is embedded on the core. Therefore, we need to have that strength, and we need it a minimum of 100 mega ohm. Once that value starts dropping, that means that I don't have the same insulation resistance no more. And if I have only one mega ohm, that means that when you apply the 4,000 volts on it, it won't hold it. It will actually fail and it will go to ground and will actually break through it. And that's exactly what we try to avoid by doing this uh, preventive maintenance and checking insulation resistance. Now, the other, the other test is the PA test, which is the polarization index. And what it does is during the mega, you let it go up to 10 minutes and then you take the 10 minute insulation resistance divided by one minute and it should be more than two. If it's more than two, then it's a good uh, it's a good insulation resistance. You have actually a number that is less than that. There is a suspicion that you probably have uh, contamination on the winding, and therefore something needs to be done. Now, one test it will tell you uh, the current condition. However, a trending will be much better because trending the insulation resistance will tell you as you go along. You know, once a year, uh, you will compare year after year, how your insulation resistance start dropping, and they will give you a good indication where actually you need to pull the model out for major overhaul. Winding resistance is important, can be done on the field. Uh, what it is, actually, you know, we have a three winding. Uh, we're gonna check the resistance that exists between phase A and phase B, between B and C, and we're gonna compare that. Why we wanna do that? You can do that with the, uh, with the uh, uh, Kelvin bridge or with the PDMA. Uh, because we want to make sure that all these coils that are connected, they are connected in series, and we have uh, jumpers and we have leads that they are joined together, and we don't want to have any hot uh, resistance joints. Meaning, because we use, uh, we brace these leads, uh, we want to make sure that doesn't have any hot spot. If you have a hot spot or hot, hot resistance joint, then when you insulate that and you apply current, because the motor will have current on it, then it will overheat those areas and it eventually will deteriorate the insulation surrounding those hot areas and it will eventually fail. And that's why it's important to actually uh, check that during turnarounds, make sure that we don't have hot spots, uh, hot joints on the winding. And that's a very simple test that can be done again, you know, during these major outages. It's important to have that and record that because, again, with the years to come, you can compare that and you can see if actually start deteriorating or not. Imbalance tests, uh, uh, inductant imbalance is part of the PDMA testing as well. Uh, this is an equipment that uh, will help you to determine whether you have a suspicious turn-to-turn uh, -turn, uh, uh, winding failures. Now, the PDMA will do that for you. It will compare the millihertz, okay? And what it is, is actually impose a high frequency, uh, low voltage uh, onto the winding. I will compare the phase one to two, two to three, and uh, one to three and what it does is because you apply frequency if it knows that what what it doing uh, impedance is for the winding it will actually calculate the millihertz that you know it goes through this winding and you have an imbalance that is an indicative that you may have a suspicious turn to turn insulation issues uh, if it is well balanced then you probably don't have any uh turn to turn issues that can be done on the field but it's a good tool to have it uh, now if we have issues that you know we find out you have an imbalance we can always do the source test. Uh, the source test is a bigger equipment. Uh, it can be done, but it's only a special request. You know, uh, the source test, especially, you know, you don't want to do it at full voltage. You probably want to do it at low maintenance level. That way we don't overstress. Now, the other thing that we recommend is we don't want to do source tests if your mega is low. We want to do it when it's stator is actively clean up 
uh, is, is free of any debris and contamination. It can be done, but the voltage to apply for these machines, it has to be discussed. And it's a case by case because we are going to actually impose a voltage between turn to turn. And let me explain you a little bit about what that does. We have conductors. Again, we have the cross sectional view. We have conductors. In this case, we have one, two, three, four conductors. Okay, we call those conductors in hand. And we have turns one, two, three, four, five, six turns. All right. So, but we have insulation between turns. Now, what is that does? We protect the winding against surge, against, you know, lighting and, and things like that. And uh, so that if you start having this turn to turn insulation to break through it, then you will have what we call turn to turn. And once you have a turn to turn, it will make a big hole on the copper. It will melt the copper because we have coils connected in series. But this test, you know, you have a suspicious, then we can always bring the equipment and actually perform a source test and maintenance level voltage. We don't want to do it to the standard that goes for this is I2522. We want to do it at much lower voltage. That way we don't want to stress out the insulation. It can be done, but in a case by case. DC high path, never high path winding the mega low. You know, that's that's the rule number one. Uh, it can be done on the field. Yes, but we don't recommend to do it. Uh, it's only in a special request. I've been asking for many reliability engineers, you know, the question, does this model last for another five years? And it's always been, uh, you know, there is different testing you can perform on the winding to actually evaluate the, uh, the condition, but it's a very good question. And one of the testing that we can do is a DC a step up high power test, but a maintenance level. We don't want to stress out the winding because once you actually stress out the winding and you're on the field, and if it fails, nothing you can do about it. You gotta be ready to rewind that. But at the same time, some reliability engineer said, I'd rather fail now than during production. And that's something that we can sit down and evaluate every model is different and evaluate the conditions that we can discuss, you know, the findings, uh, but it can be done. We don't wanna do it unless it is necess necessary for you to know whether the motor has a good electric strain or not. Or sometimes, you know, you just want to go to the next turnaround or the next uh, opening slot, you know, where we allow you to, to rewind the stator. Uh, but on the field, it's, a, it's a, it, you want to do this, they'll be ready to actually, if it fail, you know, you have to pull it out unless you have a spare available for this. Partial discharge with the, today technology, you know, we can actually do that at the field during turnaround, you know, Many, many years ago, it was not available, but today, you know, we have the Irish partial discharge tester that is available. We can go and put the bus uh, couplers on the conduit box and do offline tests. You know, with the, we can use the uh, double uh, four factor equipment as well as resonator for large machines. So this is a good uh, test to do it. However, uh, it will be a trendy, you know, because one test won't tell you whether the model is good or not, but testing it, Frequently, you know, once a year or every two years, it will tell you whether you have an increase of PD. Now, most importantly, is actually to open the motor and look for this partial discharge. Now, double testing power factor tip up test, that's also an equipment that can be done on the field, especially for 6 kV and up. We highly recommend to do that. And what you're looking for is actually uh, see if there is any voids on the insulation, discharges between coils and frame and uh, make sure that you don't have the lamination on the winding. And uh, this is a training tool as well. And uh, there is a guidelines and the IEEE 286 to follow up. It's a good test to perform on 6 kV and up machines. Now, corona testing, like I said, in today's technology, you can actually use uh, a corona probe. Uh, you can actually do the UV camera and you can see you know, if you actually have a PD on it. You can bring the resonator to the field. You can connect it, energize the, the winding one phase at a time. And then we go with the camera around the stator and it detect for any partial discharge. So uh, either you do that visually, but sometimes, you know, when you're in the beginning of this PD, because you can wrap it up the voltage, you will see that the cloud, they will start getting bigger and bigger. So therefore you have PD. And we follow the 1799 standard to do that. So. It's a very good test, very good tooling for 6 kV and up. You have suspicious, you never test a motor high voltage. You know, it's, it's good opportunity during turnarounds to perform that. Can you repair and reduce these PVs on the field? In many cases, yes. And I'm gonna show you a video 
uh, where you can see a PV, that's actually 8,000 volts that we apply to the stator. And you can see the amount of cloud that is getting bigger as we go from uh, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, all the way to 8,000, which is volts to ground on a high voltage machine. Uh, you can see the amount of PV already there on the winding. Now, therefore, you know, this is a training tool. Whether it's going to get worse through a year or two years, we don't know. But we just know the anomaly there. Now, what can you do on the field? Well, I tell you what, you know, in one day, you allow for one extra day, we can actually uh, apply uh, Corona paint on it to actually reduce the PV. Now, this is after the repairs, uh, after the same uh, area that we actually looked in the previous video. Now, after doing the repairs, applying the Corona suppression paint on it, it will actually minimize the amount of PV. As you can see now, with the P, with the camera, the same the same location. Now you don't see any PV activity at all. Now these cameras are calibrated at the lab. So we calibrate at the lab. We bring it to the site. We apply. We identify where you have the PV, and then we we actually apply this uh, paint to reduce the PV. And that actually gains some time for you to plan ahead of you know if it is going too bad that you have so many spots on it. At least you can minimize the PV and gain some time for the next turnaround. For, sorry, for rotor, uh, on a synchronous motors, one of the tests that we recommend is, you know, the turnarounds is actually perform the voltage drop test. For example, what, what that tell you is, if I have a uh, four pole, for example, on a synchronous motor, and I have these coils connected in series, if I apply 120 volts between uh, one lead to another, and I have these four poles connected in series, each coil will see 30 volts. So what we do is we go ahead and, and put a little a little hole on it, and we're going to check the voltage drop in each pole. And if it is 30 volts all the way around, it means that there is no imbalance. But we see, you know, one of the poles actually sensing only 24 volts or, or 20 volts. Then that means that this turn over here, where we have insulation, is actually failing. So you will have uh, imbalance uh, during this test. Likewise, for a low speed motors, you know, we have 20 poles, same thing. You're going to apply voltage between those, and it has to have, you know, for example, five volts in each pole, and you see one of the poles have less than five volts, then that means that you have an imbalance. Now, can this motor be operated on the field? Yes, you can. But eventually, you know, as these poles start having turn-to-turn uh, -turn issues, eventually we'll have the other poles will carry out the load, and you will have more poles as you go along. You know, on the 20 pole, you probably will have two poles, you know, with uh, not very good voltage drop. And as you go along, you may have four, six, eight, until the motor will start seeing, you know, this uh, uh, imbalanced magnetic field on the motor that will produce vibration. And that's when you're probably going to start saying, wow, I have to reduce the load to be able to compensate for that. And for production, you know, it's, it's a decision that can be analyzed in case by case. Uh, but you know, having motors that they have uh, issues with the voltage drop test, it has to be discussed in a case by case. But definitely, this can be done at the field. I'm going to have uh, Jacob uh, to uh, illustrate the mechanical inspection and testing. All right, thank you everyone for joining. We're gonna go over some mechanical inspection and testing and uh, best practices in, in the field, things that can be done out in the field. The first is shaft alignment, um, which is positioning two or more machines so that the rotational center lines are collinear to the coupling point. What that means is that they're both in a straight line and that we don't have one that's set too high or too low. Um, they're perfectly aligned. That's very important. Uh, when you're installing machines. It's also very important during outages to verify machine alignment. Things can change such as foundation shifts, piping modifications that cause strain, and poor installation practices, um, as well as hardware and corrosion failure. Especially down here in the Gulf Coast, we see a lot of corrosion on these uh, different mechanical components, so it's important to check those. 
Laser alignment is the best practice um, where applicable. There are certain machines where laser alignment is not, not feasible. However, the majority of them it is. Um, while some flexible couplings do permit some misalignment, it's generally much lower than implied by the name. It's also important to keep in mind that while flexible coupling may permit up to say 125 thousandths of misalignment, the motor and driven equipment most likely is not able to withstand that. So it's important to, to keep that in mind with flexible couplings. It's also important to uh, inspect flexible couplings as they are a wear item as well. So you wanna make sure that you're looking at those during your turnarounds as, as well. Um, excessive misalignment causes additional vibration in machine wear. Um, it's something you can actually pick up on vibration spectrum, spectral data, excuse me. Um, you can see where you know a machine is misaligned just by taking some vibration data. So it's important to do that as a trending tool um, and also as a troubleshooting tool in the field. Uh, zero alignment is seldomly recommended and that's because of a phenomenon known as thermal growth. Um, it's important to take into account that the motor and the driven equipment are not gonna grow the same amount because they're not gonna run at the same temperature. That's something that we can provide a thermal growth study on. Um, it's a pretty simple equation um, to get to that number to figure out exactly what that equipment is going to grow and then we can set the alignment accordingly. In many cases, uh, Babbitt bearings can be inspected and repaired in the field. Um, it's limited by the extent of damage if there is any, but it is important like Javier mentioned to roll the bearing out and check both halves of the bearing to see if there's any damage or see if the pattern is, you know, we want the pattern to be in the bottom 30% of the bearing. That's where it's actually gonna ride at on the oil wedge. If it's kind of coming up the side of the bearing, things like that, it's stuff that we can, you know, re-scrape in the field and reseat those bearings. So it's important to check those during turnarounds as well. Another thing that's important to check is the oil rings. If they have gouges or pitting, or if they have really sharp edges, it means that they're not rotating freely on that shaft, and therefore you're not getting the lubrication that's required to keep those bearings in the shaft uh, running for a long time. You see a lot of premature failure just because of oil rings. So that's something that's easy to check. Um, if they're split rings, they can be changed in the field. Um, and typically we have them, you know, a lot of uh, manufacturers have them on the shelves and vendors as well. So something just to keep in, in your toolbox. Oil analysis, uh, as mentioned previously, it's a really good tool for trending. It's also good for troubleshooting as well. Um, you know, when you take a sample of oil from a bearing pedestal or a housing, um, you can send it in and it'll tell you, you know, what, what, ty what type of particulates and what size particulates are in, of, uh, inside the oil. Uh, why that's important is it tells us what component is wearing, whether that's the, the bearing itself, the oil ring, um, if there's foreign material that was introduced into there, water, um, you know, we have a lot of those issues down here in the Gulf with the storms that we get. Water gets pretty much anywhere, so it's important to be uh, sampling the oil at a regular interval. Vibration analysis is another great tool for trending and also for troubleshooting. Um, a trained vibration analyst can, can look at an orbit, spectral, or time waveform data to understand the severity of the vibration and narrow down the potential causes. Uh, this can save you time, uh, you know, up front, so that if you know that you have a motor that's suspect, if you're doing trended data, you know that you can plan accordingly. I know that's big for planners and, and reliability engineers to know when something needs to come out or when they're starting to have a problem child, so it's good to do that over time. Uh, failure modes each have their own unique identifying frequencies and behaviors, so like I mentioned before, we can detect if there's misalignment you can detect if there's broken rotor bars or the possibility of loose bars. Um, things like that are very important to, to keep in, your, in mind when you're uh, creating a reliability program. Air gap was mentioned earlier. Um, it's very important, uh, especially you know on induction machines, you want to do four measurements, 90 degrees separated from each other. On salient pole motors, you want to actually measure each pole in the center of the pole to make sure that the the concentricity is the same all the way around. Make sure that's centered on both ends of the motor. Otherwise, you're going to have issues. So it's very important to do that. It's also very important to dowel pedestal pedestals on pedestal mount machines to make sure that nothing moves over time. You know, you're going to have uh, grout that, that decays over time and you have issues, but as long as you're doweled, you're going to have a lot less issues. So types of mechanical maintenance that we haven't mentioned yet are uh, bearing lubrication, that's both grease and oil bath or force loop systems. Uh, cleaning, which includes the housing and enclosure, uh, the filters, which is always a good practice to check those uh, you know, on a monthly basis to make sure that you know if they're starting to clog up and, and get those changed out before you have an issue where you have an overheating condition. 
Um, we also clean, you know, the enclosure of the motor, frame, gaskets, the stator, the rotor. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next subsequent slides. Uh, and then heat exchanger maintenance, uh, pressure test for leaks. That's very important. Um, if you have a T-Wax system, you want to make sure that that, that cooler is doing what it's supposed to and it's not leaking. So obviously dirt, dirty motors will run much hotter due to the reduction in effective cooling properties. You know, dirt and oil try to, they find their way into the uh, vent ducts within the stator and really uh, slows down or really ramps up uh, heat in those motors. So it's important to keep those free of obstruction. Same with any inlet screens and passages. You wanna make sure you're looking inside there to make sure that there's no sound deadening or, or any kind of, uh, you know, debris that's stuck down in there. You wanna make sure you get that out of there to keep these motors running cool the way they were designed to run. Uh, obviously, ventilation filters should be checked periodically and replaced as necessary. And then the buildup of contaminants on the frame, you know, certain motors get buildup of dirt on the, on the fins of the, uh, the fans. We want to make sure that those are cleaned off so that they're running properly and we're not creating a, an imbalance as well. So stator and rotor cleaning, uh, air or dry ice. Um, obviously, there's a couple different ways motors can be cleaned. Dry ice is a big one. Um, however, you need to be careful with it. Um, if it has a very brittle insulation, you can actually do more harm than good. So it's, it's good to uh, go in there and check and make sure that the, the insulation on the uh, coils can withstand dry ice cleaning or air cleaning. Um, also, if it's saturated with oil, dry ice just tends to push the oil around inside the uh, Inside the, or inside the motor and that's not a good thing. So in that case, there is electrical grade solvent that we can use to, to remove the oil and the contaminants. Um, the best practice for, for dry ice blasting is if you can move the stator, you know, slide it one way or another to be able to clean more thoroughly, that's the best, best practice because sometimes when you clean in place without pushing the stator one way or another, you're just kind of pushing dirt deeper into the motor and you can't, can't always see where it's going. So just keep that in mind as well. Here's an example of a before dry ice cleaning and after. Um, obviously, this is with uh, paint, insulation paint applied, but big difference. You know, a lot of that surface contamination, dirt and debris is gone. So now we're going to just briefly talk about, you know, when you should pull motors out. So we built this table. Um, basically, the, the rule of thumb is if you have two or more um, check marks in the critical category, you should probably think about getting that motor out for in-shop recondition, possible rewind or replacement. Um, if you have more of them in the keep trending, then do just that, you know, keep trending. You know, if you have uh, excessive winding contamination, you want to trim that by uh, doing PDMA tests to let you know how the integrity of the insulation is doing, maybe possibly schedule cleaning. Uh, but definitely field inspection at a minimum to determine how bad it is. You know, temperatures is one of the biggest things too. We want to make sure that we're uh, monitoring our bearing and stator RTDs, make sure we're monitoring those temperatures. If we start to see an increase in the trend, that's what's going to be the red flag that we need to perform a field inspection. I'm going to hand this back over to Javier for examples of lack of maintenance. This is just a few examples of lack of maintenance that uh, we identify on the field during inspection. So you can see in the left pictures, uh, that is actually an open motor. And this is a close up of the uh, air inlet where the filter should be there. Now you can see that that filter is not there. And if it is, it's just that, you know, there is no uh, proper filter material on it. So therefore all the air going uh, into this machine, eventually nothing gets captured. And, uh, so when we have motors installed on uh, environmental conditions where there is dirt surrounding, and sometimes we even have construction going on around the machine, that all this dirt, you know, will go in, inside the machine. So you expect that to get actually inside the winding. Uh, so it's important to actually do inspections to identify those, and we have to put filters on it. We add it to, as a part of the scope, just to prevent, you know, for those machines to be pulled out uh, more frequently for cleaning. Uh, this is another example, it's actually a, a new machine that it was installed, uh, but uh, what's wrong with this? Well, you can see the gaskets, the gaskets actually hanging, it's not sealing properly. Keep in mind these large machines, especially this type of machine, they don't ship those completely assembled. And sometimes you only have the frame that has a plywood on the top 
with the brackets on the shaft, but the enclosure or the top hat, that's what I call, is actually ship separate. And it's, it's expecting that to be installed on the field. During the installation, the OEM will provide you know, gaskets for that. So it's important to actually make sure that that gasket goes all the way around. Because like I said, you have a hot air right here in the center, inside, and cold air on the ends. But if you, this gasket is not, or it's misplaced, or it's, or it's missing, then you will have gaps inside that will mix hot air with cold air eventually will overheat the motor. So it's important to actually pay attention to that. That's what's wrong with this. This is actually a motor on the left picture. It's actually the load side. This is the, the shaft coming out and it has a jumper here. That little jumper here, that is actually grounded the bearing, all right? And it has a nameplate that it says uh, insulated bearing. This is the drive end bearing. Now, when I look at the non dry air bearing, it also has the same nameplate, insulated bearing. But also on the non dry air bearing, it has the same jumper. This jumper, actually, what it does is actually the insulation is inside if bypass the, uh, the insulation. So, on a motor that has insulation in both bearings, the non dry end as well as the dry end, only the dry end should be grounded. Otherwise, if both of them are grounded, then you defeat the purpose of having the insulation. What could happen is actually you don't have insulation right now. And if you leave this unattended, you can have current circulating to the shaft and you can actually break couplings, shafts, and bearings. So it's important to pay attention during uh, these turnarounds if it is connected properly. And again, checking the integrity of the insulation is important in this turnaround. So there is ways you can check this insulation uh, uh, for this resistance insulation for these bearings to make sure that we still have the insulation on. That's another uh, example of improper grounding. That's what I call lack of maintenance. So technicians or reliability people, you know, be aware of, you know, the ground cable didn't even make it to the motor. So the motors actually have a pad or a, a, a bowl where the ground should be solid grounded and connected to it on the system. So this is a right picture. It's actually, uh, this is the drive end. This is the cover of the bearing, and that's what they connect the ground. That is not the, the right, way, right way to actually ground it. You should have on the field of the motor, uh, a bowl where this ground should be solidly grounded because, you know, what we want to ground is we have the winding, we have the state of core, and the core is actually in, in intimate contact with the frame, and that's where we're going to have the ground, not here. Here is just a bowl that we hold it. So we're going to have a solid ground. So it's important to pay attention during the, uh, the turnaround, the maintenance, make sure it's properly grounded. Now, conduit boxes, that's also an important issue that uh, sometimes gets uh, over, overlooked because you know that's when we have all the connections. And again, uh, this particular uh, example, this, this box, you can see a lot of humidity buildup. Whether you have space heaters or not, you know, it may be a good opportunity to add those to it because you can see a lot of humidity buildup. What also is important is check the terminations, make sure that the cables, especially in the high bolt, that is a 13A KV, they're not touching with each other. If they touch, they can actually have partial discharge build up in the insulation. And if you don't open and inspect that, you know, eventually will fail. Now, I've seen boxes actually exploding. I've not seen personally, but I've seen pictures of boxes because the humidity gets built up and you can have loose connections and an arc and that arc will actually build up pressure inside the box that can actually blow up the covers. So it's important to actually uh, take a peek into the conduit box, make sure that all the leads are free of uh, contact with each other, they are away from ground, and make sure that all the connections are properly uh, connected. Uh, this is an example, the right picture of that. Uh, one of the leads actually, uh, you can see a little bit of PD already built up on the insulation, so that has to be fixed. Otherwise, eventually that PD will uh, erode the insulation of the cable and I will eventually fail. This is a cocker uh, jet pump application. That's one of my favorite applications for motors. So it's, uh, they start the motor several times. Uh, they have a lot of mechanical stress, a lot of thermal stress. And this actually with the bore scope. You know, with the bore scope, that was a 5,000 horsepower, four pole machine, 4,000 volts that you can see this is the core is actually how mechanically, you know, all these rings start moving away from the, from the support. And so we detect that on the field. And when it came to the shop, you know, we open it and you can see all these blocks are really uh, falling out. Actually, you don't appreciate that, but you can see a little bit deformation of the entrance already because you have 
we have a lot of mechanical stresses. And once you start missing these blocks, the coal can move. And if the coal move, it will deform. And if it deform, it will crack. And if it crack, it will fail. So eventually, you know, it's important to do inspections for these cocker jet pumps, as well as rollers, not just stators. But it's just an, one example. Synchronous motors, today we have a lot, a lot of large synchronous machines with a, with a lot of uh, mechanical components on it that, you know, we make uh, uh, big blocks to hold the mechanical and centrifugal forces. This particular one, it was the tech with the burst cup that you can see this is the V block and it has the insulation. And what it does is this V block keep this winding for being, you know, keeping the centrifugal forces on place. Now, that was the tech during uh, an inspection. If this would come out, this is made of Makara. It would probably be grinded by the ball of the stator, but that's not a, probably not gonna damage that. But once that works out, then the V block, which is a high strength aluminum, along with the ball, will start becoming loose. And if it comes loose, they will come out. And that is a steel. And once it gets into the air gap, it will be a catastrophe failure. So pay attention during turnarounds, uh, especially, you know, synchronous motors, uh, like uh, this type of machines, high speed, four pole, six pole, you know, pay attention to that. Maybe every seven to 10 years, do a good, good uh, visual inspection with the boris cup. This is another uh, synchronous motor where the V block is completely missing. But also look at the connection. We will have connection. We have pieces of copper that are connected together and because we have current on the on this uh, pieces of copper. You know, eventually because they are braced together, we create hot spots and eventually cool fatigue because we do have these rotating components that they are turning. So you have thermal stress again with centrifugal stresses. So therefore, it's important during turnarounds to uh, inspect those components. In summary, investing in a good motor maintenance practice will benefit you by extending the motor life. That's really the goal. Increasing the equipment uptime, lowering the repair costs, and helping the business unit bottom line. With that, uh, we welcome any questions or comments that you may have for Jake or myself. Hey, everyone. Um, I just want to thank you so much again for joining um this webinar really quickly before i get into the questions because i know some of you guys will probably need to duck out one um the presentation will be emailed to you by um the salesperson if they invited you to this if you found us on link linkedin or some other way it's totally okay we will be having this um, recording also on our website by the end of the week so just keep an eye out for that um we just want to make sure that i address that in case any of you guys have to hop off uh, the first question we had actually was near the beginning of the presentation. Um, it was, I noticed that core tightness is listed under the core. Would this include wedge tightness? Yes, it does. On the on the presentation, uh, the core, it's important because it has to be stuck together. And sometimes, you know, they use bolt that goes through it. And uh, they want to be sure that the core is actually tight as well as the wedge. The wedge, you know, especially if it is a hard coil, we, we have many machines that are hard coil that they use the wedge to actually secure the, uh, the winding on it. We want to make sure that that is actually uh, secure. Now on BPI, if it is a poor BPI perform on the winding, that wedge can become loose. And if that wedge is loose, then the coil will start moving. Yes, that's part of the inspection. Make sure that the wedges are tight on place. It's a good question. Great. Uh, the next question was, should the PI be greater than 2.0 for new machines or even for those in service? They are. The rule of thumb is uh, it has to be more than two. However, if your initial mega at one minute, it is more than 5,000 mega ohms, then the PI is meaningless. And we have to analyze on the case by case because you have pretty high uh, res insulation resistance to begin with. And it doesn't, in 10 minutes, it doesn't give you any time to actually polarize. So, Yes, it is have to be more than two, but if you have more than 5,000 mega ohms to begin with, which we know the standard for phone call is only 100, then it's okay. It could be probably a number that it may not mean anything to PI at all. Okay, great. Um, we have more questions. Uh, the next one is specifically on large synchronous motors. When you have field coils to replace, do you recommend all of them or just the ones with low resistance? Uh, is that for a hard coil design? 
if it is, if it is. So, if sorry, you, unless they type it in, <laughs> I don't really quite know. We is, can see if they let me, give you, let me give you both answers. If there is a global BPI system, all right, you cannot replace the coil. It has to be, you know, you can't take it out because it will rip off all the insulation. You can't take it out of the slot, all right, if it is a BPI. You have to actually rewind the stator. Now, in very large motors, like a synchronous, you know, you can actually uh, bypass that coil. You can actually cut the coil and it's still operating the motor. And of course, we have to do a, a analysis and see how much uh, horsepower we have to drop. In many cases, we can all actually, you know, still operate in the motor by cutting one coil. We're talking about large synchronous motor when we have 168 slots or, or 220 slots, you know, uh, but we have 72 slots and a, and a large synchronous with the only four pole, then cutting one coil will represent a lot of change and it will be a big imbalance. Now, if it is a hard coil, yes, you can actually, you know, replace that coil on the field by removing that, but you need to have a spare coil for that one. But again, you know, you can always have the option to bypass that coil by cutting the coil. And that, we did that on the field. We've been doing it, uh, you know, in many cases, because sometimes, you know, there is no time to actually pull the rotor out and uh, we can actually do those repairs at the field by just bypassing that coil. All right. Now, again, it's a case by case. It can be done on the field. Yes. Great. Awesome. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, I have just one other question that's been brought in. If you do have a question, now is the time to ask it. Use that question box to type it in really quickly. Um, okay. Uh, this next question that I have is, can you talk more about the Corona UV test? Yes. They just are really curious about how it's done. Yes, yes. And actually, we are about to work on the presentation that we talk just specifically for high voltage. Uh, it's a lot of information out there, but the UV camera test is very sensitive to partial discharge. So there is a standard 1799. Uh, there's an atrophy that came out years ago where we actually, uh, instead of doing what it used to be the uh, dark room test, okay, I come from the old, old fashioned way where we used to actually energize the stators. We put on the oven, you know, because we want a, a, a dark room on it. We energize the stator and then we look for actually how they start glowing, you know, if we have any PV. Now today with that technology available, which is the UV camera, you don't have to put the stator on a dark room test. You can actually do it on the daylight. And that this uh, camera is able to actually pick it up, the sensitivity of the PV, and it will see as you saw in the movie, now, there is voltages that we've got to go, and we call the DIB and D, uh, uh, the incent as you increase the voltage, you're going to see where actually you will start seeing the PD. And then you reduce the voltage when it starts going away. And based on that, and based on the standard, you can determine whether, you know, it's within parameters that you are okay, you know, to have that PD at that level or not. Now, on brand new machines, you don't expect any PD at all. You know, we don't want to have just bolters to ground to have PD right away because then eventually that machine will not last. But at least just to have bolt to ground to be free of defects, free of PD. And uh, there's a lot of information and they can email me and I can share with them all the testing that we, we perform. It can be done on the field and how we actually can alleviate that or minimize the PD on the field if, if that is an issue. Uh, so yes, I'd be happy to share if uh, they can email me and I can I can share with them the, the procedure we do to, to minimize the PD for the UV camera. Great, yeah, they sent me their email. Um, so I'll get that to you, Javier, so that you can email them more about that. Um, another question, clarification needed when grounding insulated bearings on the drive end when yes. speed reference um, yes. encoder on non-BE. One second, there's more to this. Many encoders are not insulated from the shaft, which results in shaft current when BE is grounded. Yes, that's a very good question. Whoever posed that, I've seen that on the field. And the OEMs, you know, when they design these machines, and typically, you know, if they have both bearings insulated, all right, on the, uh, because what they try to do is actually to avoid the current to flow through the shaft. So what they do is they have both bearings insulated and they put a strap on the drive end. That way you open the circuit. You have the circuit open on the drum drive end. But, you know, when it goes to the field, whatever you get connected into that end of the shaft, whether it is an encoder or whether it is an RGD or whether it is a piping, and you shut it off from that bracket to, 
from that there into the bracket, then you do the same thing. It's just like having a jumper. You defeat the purpose. Having any, anything that you will connect it to that bearing has to be insulated. Otherwise, you know, you shut it out and that can generate circular current, especially with encoders because they are attached to the shaft directly. So it's a good question. It's something that, you know, during the turnarounds, it has to be reviewed and make sure that we don't have anything that we shut it out that bearing, excuse me, that bearing insulation. Okay, great. Um, another question. Visual inspection of termination. You mentioned about stripping the insulation off. Do you then reapply the insulation if all terminations are good? You wouldn't yes. leave them stripped, would you? Yes. Uh, typically, you know, many OEMs, they design the main content boxes with enough clearances, line to line or line to ground to be uninsulated. However, because our you know environmental condition you know it's good practice to actually insulate that even though you have the clearance we would not recommend to leave those uninsulated because contamination will build up into the copper and uh, you know humidity can build up and you can actually have you know arc and what we recommend is all strip it off the insulation make sure that there is no hot spots make sure that those bolts and, and that leak uh, lug is connected and properly secure on the uh, on the copper and we have a good contact on it otherwise you know you have a loose loose bolt on it and uh, then it will generate hot spots on it and when you have current going through it the hot spot could arc eventually and and, and it could fail now that in combination with humidity inside the box which you never open it then it could actually arc and, and, and build up pressure inside the box and it can actually blow up boxes yes that's that's important to look during turnaround and Rip off the and put a new one on it. Awesome. Um, I did have another person ask, and I do want to confirm for them again that yes, we will be having uh, the recording on our website, um, at on IPS's website, but also um, you may be receiving it via email um, if you received an invitation from one of our amazing salespeople. Um, I just wanted to confirm again that yes, we will be. Um, having the recording of this presentation um, on our website for you to view. We also have a full complete list of Javier's amazing presentations as well in the past. If you wanna just get all the knowledge you can from Javier, he has um, amazing presentations on there. Another question that just popped in, where does the stator RTD fail? Where does the RTD stator fail? uh the, it says the stator rtds fail yes typically you know you have uh, by the oem six rtds uh on the winding we talk the medium and large size machines those rtds are embedded in the slot and they are used to monitor in the winding temperature in many cases you know that wire because it's rotted inside you know it can break and if you break then that RTD is not functional so you you have to check make sure that those RTDs are functional all right, on the winding. Now, if they are not, it can either be spliced and put new wire on it, you know, make those functional. But if it fails right on the sensor, there's nothing you can do about it. That's why we have six, and sometimes you even have extra spares on it that you can use. As far as the bearing RTVs, same thing. You know, you got to make sure that those are functional, and uh, because those are used to monitoring the bearing temperature, okay, and the ones for the stator, they are used to monitoring the winding temperature. And that is the only indication that will tell you whether the motor is overheating or not. There is no other way. If it is a T1, sometimes you have air in and air out that will also tell you if the delta temperature is so great that maybe the motor is overheating. But you need to look into the OEM, will tell you what is the alarm and what the settings for alarm and trip for those temperatures. All right, guys, that looks like that. The last of the questions that we've had submitted in. If you have any other questions, you can of course email Javier or Jake. Um, their emails are listed right there um, on uh, the last page of our presentation here. Um, so feel free to ask them questions. Um, we will be sending out a little thank you gift um, out to those of you who stuck with us till the end of the presentation. And um, so keep an eye out in your email um, throughout the rest of this week for that. 
Um, thank you again, Javier and Jake, for your time and giving us all of your knowledge. It's been a illuminating um, webinar, and I'm and a lot of people have messaged me how informative it's been and how much they've been enjoying it today. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Be safe, everyone. Thank you.